Amen. Glory to God. Hey, so uh, I want to do something real quick. Stephen just wanted to make a request to give, a, to give a quick testimony on the uh, thing that God did in his life, uh, Monday night of prayer. So I want to give him an opportunity to do that. Let's praise God. Hold up. You got to hold up. You, you got to hold that up because we, cause we're, cause we're live now. <laughs> it's on. Is it? It is. Did you turn it off? Try now. Testing. All right. Um, so uh, really straight to the point. Um, so God can get the glory here. Uh, Pastor had encouraged us all to come to Monday nights, um, which I haven't been doing regularly. Um, but uh, once a month, or I think his first first Mondays, he he gives a, a p prophetic in uh, healing prayer, um, and he's very intentional about that, as he said. Um, Sunday. And night and um, all day Monday, uh, I had came down with this really, I had nothing I ever experienced in my whole life. I had pain all over my body, everywhere, in my neck, in my, it, it was debilitating. Wor my, I worked all day Monday and it was, it was brutal. It, uh, it, it, it took all the manhood in me <laughs> to work. And I was, I, uh, I felt like I had broken joints and bones stuff was nothing it, it was crazy I so um, I would I wasn't I had every excuse not to come on Monday night um, but it scared me what I was experiencing it really scared me I had never experienced anything like that in my life and I'm only 40 years old and I, I, I felt like an, a hundred year old person that has got like 10 different diseases um, and so in faith, I resolved myself to no matter what, I'm going to go to prayer tonight because I know that God can heal me. Amen. And so I came, and I didn't even, I didn't even speak up. My wife came with me, and I didn't even speak up and, and request a prayer. My, my wife loves me enough that she, right away, pastor, <laughs> I got a prayer request. Uh, for my husband and so pastor brought me up and I didn't um, the Holy Spirit gave pastor exactly what I needed mm. and I didn't even realize it I'm think my mind is full of what's going on in my body mm -hmm. but in re in reality that was just a symptom Come on. And what was really going on, the, the, what the issue in my health was not just physical, but it was spiritual. And it was with years of stuff that was going on with stress, anger, unresolved forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit, and they, Gave Pastor exactly what he needed to pray and say. And that healed me. Amen. It's not just, um, it's not, there is the spiritual and the physical. And we we really don't, and I had no idea. I'm, I'm thinking like, I just, my body's breaking down, but that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea. That's the power of, of trusting and in faith coming to corporate prayer. Amen. And trusting that God can do, will do, and even cares enough to do. So um, thank you, Pastor, for being obedient and allowing the Holy Spirit to do his thing. I'm more than grateful. My wife is grateful. And um, amen. God, God gets the glory. Good. Amen. That's good. Amen. I'm always amazed. I am really amazed and grateful when God uses me in that capacity because 
this is something that's in my life that I seldom, I don't always just use in my ministry of preaching. Uh, be, not because I know it's not there, but I'm sensitive to being faithful and doing it in obedience and not just doing it out of habit. <clears throat> and uh, so Monday nights is that first Monday night of the month. It's that time for me to get into it. And I really love it because I know God uses me. I do come with the anticipation that God will use me. And so that Monday night prayer meeting really does mean a lot to me. And it gives, I, 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 I always leave refreshed and rewarded that the Lord has used me as an instrument. And that's a powerful testimony, bro. And, and, I, and I felt God touching you Monday night. And so God bless you. And God bless continually what he's doing in your life. Amen. And so this morning I am going to preach on part two of a call to arms and a cause to win. Winning the battle against deception. We don't always think very, put a lot of attention to the things that the enemy uses as a strategy against us. I, I don't think we think about it in a real rational way. I think we get very spiritual about what we think the enemy is doing in our lives when a lot of times, if we were to be honest completely, it's probably a toss-up, 50-50. Sometimes it's the enemy, sometimes it's us. But deception is one of those things, is one of those areas where the enemy truly wants to reside in our lives as believers. He is the author, he is the schemer, he is the originator of anything that's a lie. And that is what deception really is. It is, it, it is, it is taking something that supposed to be clear and understood as truth and either putting a spin on it or putting a cloak on it or a veneer on it to make it a lie and yet look like the truth. So I want to look this morning at some things that I believe in scripture that may help us to be on guard and to give us dominion uh, over the lie of the enemy that I, I think it's I, I believe it's going to help us. I'm, I'm going to be reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, all the way down to verse 34, beginning in verse 21. And once, ag and once again, I'm, I'm doing the Dave Morris thing here. I'm using a lot of scriptures. I have to do, I, I have to do my disclaimer on this because <laughs> I don't have to. It's just fun to. Anyway. So I'm going to read from verse 21 down to verse 28. Then I'm going to skip to verse 33 and verse 34. So with me. Uh, you can read it up on the, read it up on the actual, uh, that's a cool picture, isn't it? Yes, it is. And so, yeah, that picture, yeah, that kind of explains it right there. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Th and that one scripture is so much theology. Yeah. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ are I me mean, at his coming. And that right there, once again, verse 23, is packed with theology. Verse 24. Then comes the end. Have mercy. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And that, once again, is a lot of theology. Verse 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Hallelujah. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under, hi put under him, it is evident that he... Who puts all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him. Then the son himself will also be subject to him. Who put all things under him. That God may be all in all. This is a lot of theology right here at church. Now listen to verse 33. Do not be deceived. Say it with me. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now. Are we, are we going somewhere? Verse 34. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For sin, I mean for some, do not have the knowledge of God. Have mercy. 
I speak this to your shame. Lord Jesus, we need your presence this morning. We ask that you just be here to do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, we release you with liberty in this service to help us equip us, to expose us to the truth that we receive it for the glory of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Pardon me. So one of the amazing claims of Judeo-Christian heritage is that God takes on the attributes of human. He did this through Christ. God's essence is unknown. As much as we talk about God and we speak about God, even as scriptures give us understanding about God, we really don't know who God is. For those of you who say, I know him. No, you don't. You know about him. You know the God that, 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 that touches you and, and encourages you, but, 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 but the full essence of God is yet to be unknown. But the scriptures claim that God's actions are known. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? So God experiences what humans experience. This is what makes him so unique to us. In the Old Testament, God walks in the Garden of Eden. Imagine that for Adam and Eve. In the Old Testament, God closes the door of the ark. Imagine that. God smells the fragrance of sacrificed animals. Imagine that. God chases Moses in the wilderness. One of the deadliest postures as a Christian is to have in the kingdom is this, one of idleness. Because our God is not idle. To embrace the mentality that enough is enough is dangerous for us. I'm done with this. It's dangerous. Come on. I've accepted defeat, so be it. This can be related to many facets of life as a believer because we are human and we go through things that sometimes wrench us and bring us to the end of ourselves. Can I get an amen? The question that, we, that needs to be asked is, what does God have to say about this thing that you're giving up on, though? Who has the last word? Does he or does something else have the last word, including yourself? I'm going to read a quote from William Ward, who was a preacher. He says, discouragement is dissatisfaction with the past, distaste for the present, and distrust of the future. It is ingratitude for the blessings of yesterday, indifference to the opportunities of today, and insecurity regarding strength for tomorrow. It is an unawareness of the presence of beauty, unconcerned for the needs of others, and unbelief in the promises of old. It is the impatience with time, the immaturity of thought, and impoliteness altogether to God. That's a, that's a powerful quote. When you think about what he's saying here, because what he's saying here is that if we're not careful, deception will come into our lives and begin to do something that really separates us from our thoughts and our connection to who God is. I want to speak about first thing that this morning, the wounds of warfare. The wounds of warfare. We have them. We have them. For those of you who don't have wounds of warfare, that means that you ain't, you ain't, you ain't in it. I can tell you what, i never forget uh, a quote that a friend of mine told me. Uh, he says, he said, Rick, he said, I know the devil is on a chain and he's on a leash, but sometimes that leash is just a little too long. I can totally relate to that. I don't know. I remember when I was a kid, one of my neighbors and friends that I grew, that I grew up with had a little short bulldog. Bulldog name was Butch. And he was a cantankerous little ugly dog. <laughs> and because he was cantankerous and always, at, you know, I, I would always go and aggravate him. Because he was old, he had gotten old. Right. He couldn't even breathe good. And so he would lay on the porch, but he had him on a chain. 
and I knew I knew the length of the chain because I played over the, over there all the time. And 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 my friend's father would say, "Don't go near that dog. That dog. That dog will bite." Right. And so I never considered the dog because I know the, the length of the, the chain of the dog. And one day uh, the family was gone and the dog was on a chain. And uh, uh, little did I know he was on a longer chain this day. And so me being who I am as a kid, knowing that this is a cantankerous old dog and I like to I like to aggravate him. I went there and I did that. I went there, I just threw rocks at him, little pebbles at him, and he woke him up, and he looked at me with those red eyes, you know, kind of raises, like, leave me alone. But I wouldn't leave him alone, so I kept throwing rocks. Then I got a little closer because I thought I knew the length of the chain. And he got up and started running, and I turned because I thought I knew the distance, and next thing I knew, he was up on me. I had to take off running, and I could run fast back then when I was a kid, but I was too late. <laughs> I got a scar today on this thigh where that cantankerous old bulldog caught me. It's a healed wound, but yet, nevertheless, sometimes that's how spiritual warfare is. You got wounds that you've gone through for the kingdom, and you know what? I, I, I think that I think that those wounds are going to testify for your glory when you get to heaven. But then there are wounds that are self-inflicted. And I believe one of the wounds that we enter in warfare with that's self-inflicted is deception. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 through 5 gives us a, a revelation about how we should see these things. It says, but though we Walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. I mentioned this last week, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Strongholds. Casting down arguments and every hot thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. See, he gives us the key. Bringing every thought into captivity. It's not just good enough to bring something that's going through your mind. You go, that's not, that's, that can't, that's not God. But it's bringing it into captivity to what? To be obedient to God's word, to Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What, what scripture is saying here, you and I do not have dominion over the things of the enemy until we are walking in obedience to God. Right. It takes you and I being obedient to God in order for us to have dominion over those things that make us disobedient. Because it tells us very clearly here, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Which means that there's something that has to take place in us that we agree with God. So when the enemy comes to try to make us disobey with deception, that we're able to punish it and go, no, that's a lie. Are you with me? The purpose of deception is to create strongholds in your mind. Don't forget that. The purpose of deception is to create strongholds in your mind. That's a good time to put that slide up. Because I, I want you to remember that. That's the whole purpose of it. When you and I do not expose the lie and disagree with the lie, it would, it would, it would make us start rationalizing to the lie. When we start rationalizing the lie, that's when deception takes root. Are you with me this morning? We need not forget that deception is the opposite of revelation. I want you to get this clearly. Because people think sometimes that they have a revelation about something, not really understanding that you've been deceived in your mind to think a certain way. And now anything based out of your emotions is a revelation to you. And it is birthed from deception. So deception is this, the act of 
causing someone to accept as truth or valid what is false or invalid. The act of deceiving, a statement or action that hides itself in the truth. The act of hiding in the truth. It is an untrue falsehood. That's what deception is. We think deception is this emotional thing that we go through because it makes me feel like, oh, that's not right. Oh, that's not right. But, you know, you know, you know deception does come with feelings. But first of all, deception comes in an analytical and rational mind. So that you begin to think and start thinking out things that has nothing to do with truth. But your emotions and your experiences are telling you that this is truth because it applies to how you feel about it and what you've gone through your experiences in it. Hello. And so it's hiding. It is hiding itself as a falsehood and it's invalid to what really is truth, but a lot of times we do not embrace, we don't accept it as a deception because we feel smart about our conclusion. Now, revelation is the act of revealing or communicating a divine truth. Revelation is not based on your feelings. Are you with me? Re aren't you glad? <laughs> Aren't you glad that revelation is not based on your feelings? It's based on divine truth. It's based on the word of God. It's based on who God is, his nature. It's, it's something that is revealed by God to you and I. The act of making known something that was secret or hidden spiritually. Or a fact that has been made known spiritually to you. An uncovering of something a mystery that you did not know before, but the Holy Spirit has now made it known to you. Revelation is the supernatural communication of truth to the human mind. Are you with me? That's what it is. A bringing to light of that which has been previously or wholly hidden or in obscurity from truth that's revelation and i think sometimes we mix the two up and god wants us to understand that his revelation to you and i has nothing to do with our emotions our emotions may come out of the revelation but your your emotions doesn't produce the revelation can i get a witness our emotions do not produce the revelation. It is something that happens divinely from the Holy Spirit when you and I are walking in obedience. Hello. You're not going to get revelation in rebellion unless God is trying to rebuke you. Shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I need to repent. Revelation comes out of obedience. It comes out of you walking with God. Draw nigh unto God. He draw nigh unto you. When you and I are not drawing nigh unto God, we are set up for deception. Because we are, we are set, when the word does not govern your behavior, when the word doesn't govern your behavior, you are a prime target for the enemy to deceive you. Now, if Peter can be deceived, how much more you and I? So we don't, don't, don't get all high and mighty about this. I can honestly say I, I, I've been deceived more times than I want to count. I believe too often we forget one of the master strokes of the enemy is deception in our lives. Because we think we can't be, which is arrogant. It's arrogant for you and I to think that we cannot be deceived by the enemy. And when we are arrogant, we don't put up any defenses because we think we got it all worked out. When we're arrogant in our mind about the fact that we cannot be deceived, we do not do what is, what is necessary to make sure that truth is ruling in areas where we may be a little too arrogant. We may be a little too, it's not, you know, it's nothing wrong with being confident because we all should be confident in Christ. But we also, we, we also need to be very humble. And we need to be willing to be taught by the Holy Spirit and even by those who have gone places that we have not gone before. 
Let, you know, I, this, this man, Jeffrey Rose, this, this, this guy that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to know and his, his experiences in life. This, I mean, it's, when you look at him, you think, well, he don't have much to offer. He has a lot to offer. He has a lot to offer. I can't wait to sit down and talk with him. Because I believe that I'm going to glean something from his life that's going to edify and strengthen me. He's going through things that I've not gone through. And he still loved Jesus. He's still faithful. And these are the things that we need to understand a lot of times in serving God that, you know, it, it, it is not people's willpower that's, that, it, that keeps them safe. It's people y- yielding their will to the word of God that keeps them and fortifies them. Willpower is, is, willpower is just a little bit of what it takes to really stand in places where it's hot sometimes. You, I mean, if, if, if you stand there because I'm just going to, I'm just going to, um, I'm not going to be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. Read every, time in, read every time in God's word where people were able to stand. They were not standing on nothing but his word. And we say, oh, I know it's the devil. I know. And yet we allow his plans to be carried out in our life. The question is why? We need confirmation to our efforts. That's why. Don't we? We need confirmation to our efforts. And this was the whole assault from the devil on Job's life. Think about when you read. Next time you read the book of Job, and I hope you read it sometime before the year is out. Next time you read it. Think about this is what the enemy assaulted in Job's life. Every argument that Job's made was to this defense. Right? Because we all need confirmation of our efforts. You need to be careful. Because sometimes God don't confirm every good thing we do. At some point in time, he expects you to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Amen. <laughs> you, do you really need to be confirmed? Because I didn't steal. I didn't steal it. I feel so good. <laughs> Somebody can give me a sticker. No, do you really need to be confirmed for every, every right thing you do? No, you, we shouldn't have to. And so the enemy knows this. So take away these things. This is what he said about Job. Take away these things that confirm his confidence and he will curse you take away the thing that 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 in his mind is confirming your goodness take away these things that is confirming that you that you see him you love him take away these things that 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 confirm his reward that you that you love him and he's doing all the right things take away those things and he will curse you Because the enemy knows that you and I are always looking to be congratulated some kind of way. Even to the point where we we will use the word of God to justify why we deserve to be congratulated. And we need to understand that this was meant to rob Job, listen, of his confidence in God's goodness And give him a different mind than what he had before he went through what he went through. And it's the same thing with you and I. The devil is waiting to do things to put us in places to challenge us to give us a different mind than what we had prior to going through what we're going through. Because that's the mind that is open for deception. That's the mind that is justifying why, I, why, you, why things are the way they are. And so we need to understand that this meant that Job would be robbed of his confidence and therefore the goodness of God. And what's the use of doing good anyway if this is going to happen to me? What's the use of keeping my testimony when bad things happen anyhow? What's the use of praying? What's the use of fasting? What's the use of contending? What's the use of committing myself to who you are when all these things are happening to me anyway? Hello? Hello? 
the, 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 the enemy knows very clearly what's going on inside of our hearts and minds. I mean, think Joe. Joe was doing good. Joe was sacrificing. Joe was praising God. He was even praying for his children. He was doing all these things. And everything that Joe was giving God praise for, the enemy said, let me take away that confirmation and see how he acts. You know, the thing that the enemy also uses against us is the vanity of our timetable. <laughs> We're so vain to think that God has to move on our time. <laughs> God's got to do it when we say it needs to be done. Oh, okay, so God, you got to have it done by, by this time, okay? Because I've been, I've been hanging in there long enough already now. So where the heck are you? I don't mean to be rude, but you know, you know what I mean. Surely by now. Surely by now, God. And, and, it's, so, and it's so vain of us. And, and the enemy will use our deadlines. <laughs> he will use our deadlines of God being good. Or God. And by now, I've gone through this enough. Shoot. Crying out loud. Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> this is enough already by now. And we, and we would do that. And then, and, and then we have the audacity to work ourselves up and get all emotional. God, you know I'm faithful. God, you know I'm doing everything I know to do. You know, you know. <laughs> and we, and we, <laughs> we've given God this deadline for success. And all it is, is a trap of delusion. Because you think that when you feel that God feels just like that. He'll agree with me for crying out loud. Don't you agree with me? And God doesn't answer. You get mad. You get vexed, and you lose your victory. You lose being, you, all your Christian virtue just go out the window. You're angry. You want to fight, you curse. <laughs> Vexation is, has overcome you. I can't be happy no more. Can't have joy. Who can have joy in this? Who can have peace in this? Who can have love in this? Who can worship God in this mess? See, some of y'all stand there going, I don't feel like that. I don't. <laughs> Live long enough. Okay, let me give you a revelation. God can make a way to pay your bills when he sees fit. God can save the loved one when he sees fit. God can open doors to your life that favors you when he sees fit. God can show you favor in any situation when he sees fit. God can heal when he sees fit. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Not when you see fit. When I pray. When I pray about it, it's time for you to come down. We sing songs about you coming down. Come on down, Jesus. Come into the situation. Come into the circumstance. We, you know, no, no, God, we, we want to see. We pray. We believe. We be, I got faith. I believe you could, you could pay my bills. I, I believe that you could save my loved one. I, I, I believe, but I'm tired already. When are you going to do it? And just because God does what he sees fit, it doesn't mean that he has changed his mind about his promises for you. Can, can I leave you with this? It's you. It's not God. It's your vanity. Your arrogance. To think that God got to do it on your timeline. You've allowed the devil to trap you in your emotions. 
And he has made you look at God with critical eyes. And you're deceived now. Because your efforts need to be rewarded. And now you're walking in delusion and deception. And you don't even realize it. Why you're angry at God and you're angry at people. It's, it's not because God's not good. People don't even know why you walked around looking at them crazy. It's you. You've been bitten by the poison of deception. You've allowed disappointment to hold you down. To where the enemy now can poison you anytime he wants. Keep, keep you from pursuing the promises that God has placed in your heart. You've abandoned those things. How much more of your life are you going to surrender to the enemy's lies? I'm going to close with this. Mercy and grace. Aren't you glad for those? Mercy and grace. Psalms chapter 4 verse 1 says, Hear me when I cry, O Lord, for my righteousness. You are relieve me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Psalms 145 verse 8 says these words. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Slow to anger and great in mercy. While we're in this place of needing to be confirmed for doing what we think is right God is looking at us with loving eyes hoping that we break the spell of the enemy on our mind do you know this is the only thing that the only place of our life that God says you fix that your mind he said you correct how you think you you deal with what's going on inside of your head that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 is all about. He said, you deal with what's going on up there. You bring those lies into captivity. You address the fact. You cast the enemy out of your thoughts. You hold him accountable. You call him for who he is. And you acknowledge that. God says, you deal with that. And he said, he said you deal with that, and I'll be God. God, you do you, and I do me. That's what God is saying. We, we can't be God. Only two people said no. The re <laughs> the rest of y'all think y'all can be God. <laughs> we can't be God. We can't do him, but we can do us. Amen. We can do our part. We can do our part. Amen. God is saying, you, you do you, and I'll do me. Amen. And in the midst of you going through what you're going through while you're working it out, there's grace. There's compassion. There's mercy waiting for you and I to come to the place where we acknowledge and expose the enemy for who he is. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. He's waiting for us to come to that place. I mean, because sometimes, and, and sometimes it tastes a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. In the good, the bad, and the ugly, God is still sovereign. And sometimes God allows us to be in the, in, in the bad and the ugly. Not because, he, not because he can't get us out of it. You, you're in the bad and the ugly because of the way you think. Because the way you think you're there. It's, it's not so much the devil, this is the devil. You have given the devil a red carpet. <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have rolled the red carpet out to the devil. Come on in. Oh, that's you. Babe, it's the devil. No. <laughs> You, you let him waltz right in, man. He has a, he, he has a key now. He, and, you know, and you thought you only gave him the key to the front door. He don't went and got keys made for every door in the house. He shows up like the janitor. Tink, 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 tink. <laughs> he got a ring of keys right now. Showing them to your house. <laughs> you can't go over here though. I got a key. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> and God is waiting for you and I to expel him. He's waiting. And too many Christians are saying, 
you know, we think that because God, we, God sees where we are, that God is pitying us and have mercy on me. God, I need you to fight for me. God says, I've already done that. I've already done that. I need for you to rise up and deal with that. Fo- Excuse me. Deal with him. That's what I need you to do. I need you to rise up and call him for who he is. He's, he's giving him keys all over the place. Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2 says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money. That should be all of us. <laughs> I know you don't want to admit it. <laughs> come, buy, and eat, he says. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what that does not satisfy. Some of us are laboring so hard in the wrong places, the wrong way. He says, listen, listen to me and eat what is good. Because the Bible says your words is something that you will eat. And your soul will delight. In the richest affair. Don't forget that passage. Isaiah 55 verses 1 and 2. You, you, should, you should never forget that. Because it really is a matter of perspective, isn't it? It is. It's a matter of perspective. Do, do you know that food and cleanliness are not always viewed in the same perspective? And my wife is a stickler for, for restaurants when she sees people out back smoking cigarettes. <laughs> yes and then they go back in there and fix your food she had a problem with that do you know it, 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 the church in medieval times disdain the church disdain personal hygiene you can put that up you know why because the church maintained that the, uh, that the unkept body was proper mortification of the flesh Ooh, aren't you glad for revelation? Aren't you glad for revelation? The problem is our hearts. James 4 says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Then he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Because that's what deception does. It brings you to a place of double-mindedness. God is calling you and I to a place where we are. He doesn't want us to be robbed. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to be lifted. And I want to close with this. In order for us to be lifted up, one of the things that we have to learn is humility. We ever seldom we hear about humility in, in serving God, but humility must be taught. People like to say, well, I'm just a humble person. Hmm. The fact that you have to say that. My antenna's already going up. I'm just going to stand back and watch it. Because hum- humility is taught. You don't just be a humble person, just go, I'm just humble. I just, I just give people the shirt off my back. And I just, you know, I can't let people, I see hurt and I just got to get involved. I want to help people, this and that. Until you're angry. Until you got a reason to be mad at somebody. Until you think you deserve vengeance. Until you validate what it is that you don't like. And your humility is nowhere around. You just profess to have humility. But you have not disciplined yourself to walk in humility because humility is taught. You got to go through some things to be humble. And not only go through it, but go through them the right way. Because you can go through hell the wrong way and come out a disciple of hell. 
<laughs> and that's truth. You got to go through things the right way to be humble. You got to let things have, sometimes you got to let wrong have its way to learn humility. And people who think that they got to be right do not let that happen. People who think that they are right, don't let that happen. Because it's, I don't deserve to let wrong go by. I don't, I don't, are you kidding me? I got to give them peace of my mind. Can I tell you this? There's an appointed time for every believer to learn the attribute of humility. And so it's not just one time. I wish to God it was just one time. And God, give me the date, right? I can prepare myself. I will fast and pray before that day comes. I'll be ready. I ain't going to like it, but I, can, I believe that I can go through it in prayer and fasting. I believe that, that this too I can go through. It's, it's your past with prayer and fasting, Lord, just give me. But see, it ain't like that. God doesn't give you warning in your class on humility. God will let you get to the place to see how you're going to act and go, see, there you did it again. You ain't learned none yet. I love you still, though. We're going to go through this again. No. No. I don't want to go. I learned it. I learned it real good. I learned it real good. You didn't learn nothing. I'm going to let you go through it again. I'm going to teach you what humility is. Don't you know you're going to learn this? This is the door to favor and blessing. Humility. Some of us, we bang our heads over and some of us are going to bang our heads all the way to heaven. Others will learn this valued lesson and become teachers of it to others. But a lot of us are going to be banging our head all the way to heaven. We're going to have knots when we get to heaven on our head. You're going to say, Lord, I thought I was going to get a glorified body. I just wanted you to know. All the time that you did not yield. That's what these knots are. Can you imagine that? And the scripture says in Hebrews 5, 8, that through, <laughs> though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. <laughs> We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus now. And God says, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. No, I'll be good. Right? We do not want to suffer anything that's going to deal with our ego, our emotional comfort, and our physical discomfort. I, I, I will learn humility without going through those things. Give me the quick course. You ever get a ticket and, they, and, you, and you go online to, it, 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 it to take the uh, courses because you don't want it on your insurance and they give, you this, they give you this thing called quick quick ticket fix and everything. And uh, I've done that a couple times. <laughs> and they always slow you down because you're going too fast on those tests. You need to slow down. You are like 45 minutes too fast. I'm like, what? It says quick. But they want to make sure you're getting it. They want to make sure you're getting it. So they won't let you go faster than what they think that you should be reading and understanding and agreeing and, 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 and analyzing. Okay, yes, this is why I did it wrong. This is where I messed up. This is what I need to know. I, I got it now. I understand it. I won't do it again, right? Then God, then God, says, that's how, God says, there's no quick course. There's no quick course. You're going to learn humility. You're going to learn humility. You're going to walk through it. God, I, okay, it, it, can I fast my way out of this? No. No. You're not fasting out of this. But your word says, does some come out only by prayer and fast? He said, yeah, some come out. You ain't coming out until you learn. You're going to get this. <laughs> You're going to learn humility. I need you to get this because you're praying for blessing that you're disqualified for until you learn this. 
You want me to open doors. You want me to move. You want me to bless. And you're not, you're not, you're not qualified for that. But you, I'm your child. Yes, you are. And I want to bless you. So learn humility. Unfortunately, we don't control the dynamics by which we learn these things. Nor do we control it by which other people learn it also. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't learn that way. This is reserved only. And oftentimes it is revealed through our choices. The heart is converted from sin to the posture of humility. Your, your spirit man wants to yield. It's your flesh that says, mm -mm. and that's why it's not always good to rescue people out of their wrongdoing. Yes, yes, because you never know what God is doing through it. No. No. Just because people are going through something that you go, man, God, I just want to, I just, I just want to pray about God. This new. Did I get rescued? And don't, don't try to play God here. Step back and let me be God. Mom, dad, husband, wife. <laughs> right? Let me be God. Let me be God. Don't be trying to rescue them just because you, I feel so sorry for them. Then, then pray for them that they act right. Pray for them that they act right. I just want them just, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to give them the rent money. Why? I'm going to give them the card note money. Why? They had $5,000 just two weeks ago. Oh, see, y'all don't want to hear this, man. I, I, I. But doesn't God, but, 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 but God, but God has allowed me to help. God, God, God has also allowed you to not get involved. You are making yourself get it. Humility teaches us to close doors in our lives. You know that? It teaches you where you should place your sympathy. Yeah. You will learn this through humility. Your prayer life will increase and with greater understanding when you walk in humility. Humility is a pain that kills our flesh. It is, and your flesh is the only thing humility will kill. It won't kill your spirit. It, 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 it'll, it'll crucify your flesh. One man called it the assassination of the flesh. Humility. It forces you to die where you rather live. Hello. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. We, we, see, we're talking about a call to arms. Do you really want to win? Do you really want to win or do you just want to say uh, you want to sing the song you want to win? I want to sing the anthem. I want to sing the march song. <laughs> I want to sing the anthem that says I'm winning. <laughs> but do I really want to go through the work of winning? Do I really want to walk in humility so I can win, so I qualify myself for blessing and favor? Do I really want to do that? Or do I, do I really do I want to give up these things that I know that the Lord is speaking to me about the Holy Spirit is, is telling me? He says, you, know, you know, the enemy, you know, don't see. God doesn't want you to give up. God wants you to persevere. But God wants you to persevere in him. Persevere in him. Because he is sovereign, he is merciful, and he is gracious. So I encourage you that this morning, determine to win in Christ. Because you're already one in Christ. Let's give him praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is so faithful and so good.
Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. I've always read that in the past. I've, I, I've, I've used this scripture on, you know, with my kids. It's echoed again in Proverbs. Be wise. Do not surround yourself with people who don't have your same convictions about truth and things of God. Do not let them have access to your heart because, and your mind because they, they can sway you from the place you stand in God. And as I was putting this message together, God spoke to me. God says, what about the company you keep in your mind? What about the company you keep in your mind? I'm like, wow. Evil company corrupt good habits. When you and I are keeping bad company in our minds, guess what it's doing? It is corrupting the very thing that you are using as a sounding board of conviction and truth in your life. When the lie is being entertained, it's bad company. And eventually it will corrupt truth. The truth that you have stood on, the truth that you have relied on, the truth that has kept you sound, the truth that brings joy, the truth that brings peace. When we're not careful, evil company will corrupt the truth. And sometimes the company is, a lot of times, not the physical flesh and blood, but it's, it is the thoughts it is the mindset that is oftentimes, oftentimes birthed out of experiences and choices that we make. So God wants us to be those who are wise. He wants us to be those who qualify ourselves for his favor and for his blessing. Then he says, awake to righteousness. Do the work keeping your mind in the place where humility will be a discipline. And do not sin. Do not sin. It's the same connotation here when James says, be angry and sin not. It's the same connotation when Jesus told the lady who was caught in adultery, go and sin no more. He has not given us a an unreasonable standard to live for him in. He is saying, be mindful that the enemy is looking to use flesh and blood to bring you to the point of sin and deception. Don't give him that avenue. Don't give him that place. Know that that's his strategy against you. It's to bring you to that place. And don't give him that place. Go and sin no more. Don't give him that place. That's all he's saying. Don't give him that place. He don't deserve it. You're a child of the king. You are beloved. You are elevated in my thoughts and in my heart. In my heart. My, my heart is towards you. For you, not against you. I know the thoughts that I have for you, said the Lord. They're good and not evil. To bring you to an expected end, a hope. Full, full of the things that you even desire in your heart. He says, this is what I want for you. This is what I have for you. Is there a process that my love is going to allow you to walk through so, that you, so you qualify yourself? Not by works, but simply by yielding, but simply by saying, yes, Lord. I learned this lesson for your glory. If Jesus himself had to learn obedience, humility, how much more are you and I? I pray this morning that the enemy has been exposed. I pray this morning that you can honestly distinguish deception from revelation. 
I pray this morning that you understand that it's, it's so easy to have a vanity or have a vain outlook on the timeline that we want God to do things. That we're careful about that. That we're not walking in the spirit of delusion and deception. That we're not vexed by outcomes simply because of our mindset and the choices that we make. That we know that there's mercy and grace always present for us. Always. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Come to me, those who are thirsty, to the waters. You who have no money. This is simply you who have no strength. Come by and eat. Get what you need without money and without cost. And then he says this, and why, why spend your resources and your strength on that which does not satisfy? Listen to me. Eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the riches thereof. I want to pray for you while you're sitting at your seats this morning. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We are grateful, Lord, to be called your people. We are blessed to be called your people. And this word this morning has made impact in our hearts and our minds. And we understand, Lord, that the work of the mind is ours. It's ours. And I pray this morning that as we are sitting here and as we are embracing the work of the Spirit and the word that's been said, that we are stirred for that work. We're encouraged to do that work. And we're, we are empowered by your Spirit to walk it out. And from this moment forward, we will yield as the Holy Spirit reveals to us who you are in every moment. And the work of humility is the work of grace in our lives. That we discipline ourselves to walk in it for your glory. For truly we have been favored. Truly we have been set aside to be blessed and elevated. And I pray the blessing of God over your people this morning, Father. I pray that you will strengthen, that you will lift up, that you will cause areas that have been weak to be fortified in strength. Areas where there has been failure to be renewed with new vitality and hope again to see victory. And we thank you for this. Your mercy and grace prevail in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's give him praise for that this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Let's all stand to our feet this morning one more time. I want you to be encouraged this morning. I want you to know that your God is on your side. There's a perseverance that comes that has fruit to it. Don't you? Isn't it rewarding to see the fruit of your labor? Isn't it? When you persevere and you know that you're doing it unto God and that there's something good that comes out of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Yesterday, my wife and I were moving a lot of bricks. Over 300 of them. That, y'all, that was a good place to go, ooh. It's a lot. I started the process thinking I'm just going to move one pallet. And then I'd be, that I feel good about myself. But you ever started something and you, and you get into it and you go, ah, oh, I'm going to press it through. Ah, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to get this done. And you get the first one done, you go, I'm going to get it done. Then you, you saw the second one, you go, what am I thinking? But you commit yourself, right? Because now I got I to gotta see this thing through. I got to see the end of it. And so my, my wife saw me weaning. <laughs> Halfway through the second pallet, she goes, I'll help you. 
<laughs> See, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to say good, but I was like, thank God, thank God, thank God. And well, so before it was all said and done, we got it all done, man. And, and, and then we were able to sweep and water down everything. Else, like, and, I, and my back was killing me. My legs was killing me. I, I mean, mm, I couldn't wait to take some pain pills, right? But we got it done, and I, and I was able in pain to step back and look at the fruit of our labor and go, wow. I'm going to sleep good tonight. I'm going to sleep good because I saw the fruit of the labor. And, and a lot of times, that is exactly what God wants us. He said he wants us to see the reward of perseverance. There's a reward to perseverance. Don't ever forget that. But persevere in him. Persevere in him. Amen. So the Lord bless you today. Have a wonderful, blessed day in Christ. Amen. You are dismissed. Hallelujah.